Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. The military action of the Russians in Ukraine has brought all eyeballs across the world to the region of Central Europe. A lot of us are busy discussing the tactical maneuvers that are happening on the ground. One rocket being fired here, one missile being dropped there, one MiG-29 here, one Sukhoi-35 there, five tanks and this and that and the other. What I'd like to do with General Bhatia here, who's there with me, a former DGMO of the Indian Army, is to understand the larger military perspective as well as the strategic outlook of this entire battle. Sir, thank you so much for joining me for, I think, a discussion which is not being conducted on the mainstream media with regards to the actual background of this battle and actually what the issue is and what are going to be the outcomes of it. Uh, thank you, Adi Jahan. Uh, always a pleasure and an honor being on your platform. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wishing your viewers uh, the very best. Uh, yeah, the key question is, uh, uh, what is the bigger picture? Uh, if you look at Russia, what are the Russian interests? Why has Russia done what it has done? Why now? Uh, so in the immediate, I would like to say that uh, it is the geography which dictates uh, the national interests for Russia. Uh, if you look at the whole picture, uh, after the break of Soviet Union in 1992, uh, President Bush of the United States, uh, he, he he made a sort of a, uh, give assurance to Russia uh, that Eastern Europe would not be part of the NATO alliance. That was the military alliance. Right? But if you look at the things, and after 1997, 14 nations have joined NATO. I'm talking Eastern European nations. So the conflict zone has shifted from Basically, Central Europe, uh, which is the key interest area of uh, Western of, of the West, to Eastern Europe, and the last three which are left was, of course, you know, uh, we know what happened in Georgia, what happened in Estonia, uh, what happened in Crimea, Belarus. So Belarus, Crimea, and Ukraine, and Ukraine is the largest. It's the second largest country in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, it's a very large country, right? And if Ukraine was to join the NATO, and that has been on the cards earlier also in 2014. Uh, before 2014 also. Uh, so th there's a history to it. And if, if Ukraine was to join the NATO, the borders would have come right at the Russian borders. And no nation, no nation wants to ever be threatened on its borders. You fight wars in, in, your in the territory of your adversaries. You carry the war, the battle into your adversary territory. And you protect, like, if you look at US, what China does, Mongolia, you know, Pakistan, so most countries do that, uh, big countries that is. So Russia also. And second thing and more important thing is Russia gets access to the you know the warm water ports, the Baltic, the Mediterranean. If it's not NATO, then NATO uh, and Turkey also is a part of the NATO. So they are at the mercy of NATO for to access their uh, the, the, the the ports. So Russia couldn't have allowed this. And that is where national interests of Russia lie, and that's what Russia has done, what it has done. The second thing about what it has done now, you find uh, that the U.S. has lost uh, geopolitical space. Uh, the world order is changing, the world is shifting from the west to the east, and China has become, is threatening the U.S. for a bipolar world, and it's supported by Russia. After the exit from Afghanistan, uh, there has been, uh, the, the world looks at, uh, you know, US, U.S. sometimes as not very reliable. I would say not very reliable. Right. Having uh, the exit from US was expected. So uh, the US forces have to exit uh, uh, Afghanistan. But the way they exited uh, was the key issue. And then Russia chooses the day to launch, very important day to launch, which sends a strategy signal when the UN, United Nations Security Council is meeting. And 23rd February also happens to the Russian Armed Forces team. Right. So if you look at the whole thing, so Russia has done that and Russia has followed up, you know, the warfare strategy, what it has done earlier in Czechoslovakia in 1966, uh, what it did in Afghanistan. So they, they have gone, taken all the, uh, the airports, the airspace, captured the key vital installations and then pushed in the troops. So there's not much of a battle which is happening. It's not a hard fought battle. They, they just rolled over and taken over what they did in Czechoslovakia. Uh, if you look at it, you know, then they've used multi-domain warfare, the cyber attacks, it's information domain, which is a very important domain, right? Information domain, and then the economic domain has to still come into play. When, say, Nord Stream 2, uh, the prices of oil have shot up. So, if you look at the whole thing, I think Russia has uh, played its strategy really smart. They have protected their interests and we should grant it to them. 
so the bigger picture is this and key issues are where does the indian interest like what what goes on from here onwards absolutely sir before we get to indian issues that's something that i have to you know keep for the last part of the interview as a matter of fact uh, i'd like to ask you sir broadly stated what would you think are the military objectives of the russians you gave us a hint with regards to the airports and the key military areas what do you think broadly defined would be the military objectives given to the russian army uh, i that's a very interesting uh, uh, question uh, what we should be looking at is what is the what is the end state which russia would want particularly i think russia would want an end state uh, where ukraine has a uh, uh, has a pro russia regime so it's a regime change definitely russia would look at an end state where at least two of the you know it cuts away ukraine and two of the territories are now part of states of russia sort of a thing that the deal has been signed the agreement was signed so uh, we should and as as reported the president of ukraine has uh, you know taken shelter in like i don't know whether it's right or wrong because there's so much of disinformation going on so it's very easy it's very difficult to know what said right there's a, there's a fog of war and the fog of war will always be there so what i what i look at the end state uh, particularly end state of russia uh, for the present is a uh, pro russian regime in ukraine uh, which furthers russian interests okay the national interest is very very important now the thing is what uh, the, you know now it gets routed to a nato again so but the ukraine, ukraine because the buffer between the russia the east uh, europe and that is russia and others so i i feel there will be a uh, there will be regime change and uh, they will get the access to the warm water ports as they want i think there is a very simple straight objective and that is something that the president of ukraine has also been talking about uh that they want me out of uh, ukraine um you know you you've brought it out in a very very simple way so there was a news today and that ukrainians have also confirmed that the russians have taken over chernobyl uh of the military objective of a regime change how does chernobyl and its features uh in terms of the reactor and everything come into play is there a nuclear threat in any way that the russians are trying to avert no i i don't think there is a nuclear threat because ukraine has declared itself as non nuclear mm-hmm. and uh, russia would have known about nuclear chernobyl is of course uh, you know chernobyl land it, it if you look at the thrust lines uh, the russian thrust lines uh, north east and the south it got three thrust lines and it it comes in, in into those thrust lines and chernobyl is uh, of course you know uh, it is very good for the information domain right to the chernobyl everyone in the world knows chernobyl that in 1986 uh, what happened chernobyl so uh, we, we if you look at the major cities they were just the major cities which is what is a which is key with the part so uh, we we look at russia which is aiming at uh, demoralizing the ukrainian forces and the ukrainian people and telling the world that look you know uh, you know look at the p5 russia is part of the p5 and russia got the chinese support with them and he he they tell the people look we are doing this do what you want to do it so they are reasserting their space in the uh, equation of world politics the geopolitics that is the world world order the geopolitics they are reasserting it is a very big nation it still is a very big nation if you look at it and we should not forget that ukraine also has vast reserves of uh, natural resources vast reserves of natural resources the uh, nation was uh, it used to feed uh, you know so many things and that that uh, now becomes uh, you know uh, another uh, russian objective is to access those natural resources i i like the way that you put it across so this war uh, or this military action if i may put it that way has is is more of a symbolic military action obviously fighting on the ground yes but the kind of objectives that have been chosen are symbolic to create a little bit of a of 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 a message or a narrative and i agree with you with regards to the most known cities being attacked uh, which are known throughout the world odessa and all these are are world famous uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, line of uh, strategy that the russians have chosen sir as a retaliation the americans and everybody else have come out with sanctions uh, which was much predicted uh, you know the russians have kind of just brushed it off their shoulders and there was a news today that the president putin met with a business delegation uh, from russia to actually put the plan in place with regards the sanctions that means the plan was already ready um how do you think the sanctions are going to work for russia and aren't these the sanctions responsible for russia's 
aggression today with regards to uh, its reasserting its place in the world? As I say, excess of everything is bad. Excess of sanction is also bad. If you think the sanction, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the sanction strategy in itself is suspect. Uh, sanction basically it is annoying, it is irritating. It raises the cost, but it doesn't raise 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 the cost to an extent where you deter uh, uh, adversity to safeguard national interests. Sanction is basically a noise because India was been sanctioned so many times. Uh, you know, it's not once, not twice, so many times. But it is the and and what did the sanctions do for India? We had a nuclear program going. We had the integrated missile development program going. We had the ISRO going. So I think sanctions in a way also give you you know sort of a self reliance in that case. The, the, the thing is that uh, they are threatening Russia with financial sanctions, and uh, it is the the five banks, uh, the three billionaires. So what is Russia going to do? Is, is that going to change Russia's behavior? I don't think so. It is going to deter Russia from uh, its, uh, what, what it is doing? I don't think so. It will increase the cost, yes, definitely. But then Russia, uh, it may also give uh, a different avenue uh, to China and Russia to get out together. They will find ways and means. Uh, if Europe has to get oil, it has to get energy, it has got to get gas. Where does the gas come from? The, the oil is, oil prices are rising and they have already risen. So uh, the U.S. is not affected because in, in the U.S. the military industrial complex, the oil and the pharma industry, they, they have their major players, right? Uh, but Europe uh, is going to see, uh, uh, you know, the energy prices is going to worsen in Europe. The costs are going to go up, and you now combine it with the COVID situation and the economic downturn which has taken place, and you feel, feel a cascading effect. It is not that all European nations are sitting on big, big cash reserves and they can see through it and they can afford it. No one can afford costs from this. The governments, they are the democratic governments. Democratic governments have to make sure that the people are, you know, uh, the well being of the people is very important. And uh, we in India also have to say, say that. And the costs have already gone up $100 plus now. So let, let's see if it, uh, how, how long it lasts. Uh, I don't think this should last very long. Uh, we should soon see an end to it. And uh, the intensity of the conflict, uh, let me also put it, uh, I, I may sound very odd because I'm a military man, so I, I, I see I see numbers as indicative of the intensity. And the numbers do not show uh, the, the intensity of the defender to defend the nation. Right? The casualty figures which are coming out, uh, uh, there is the casualty figures which are coming out, both in terms of men and material, are not indicative of major uh, battles. Right? There are skirmishes uh, in the sense. And th there is a march which the uh, Russians are doing. So I, I don't think this is going to be a very long, it will be a swift operation, and the Russians are known for that. Um, I don't think the Ukraine has the military power, their capabilities also to stand up to Russia on their own. Uh, which brings me to my next question, sir, the battle of narratives or the information warfare which is actually taking place. Um, you know, militarily, I'd, I'd actually like to break this question down into two small parts. One. Uh, the kind of military equipment and uh, material that the Russians had uh, collected uh, on the borders of Ukraine fully utilized would have had a much swifter action. Um, so it has Russia used its full potential uh, as is being portrayed by the Ukrainians? And secondly, the rumors about the Ukrainian president missing in action, as you also mentioned very clearly, just tells us the kind of information warfare which is actually taking place. So is the war as intense and as strongly being fought by the Russians or is basically very, very tactical maneuvers that are being made by the Russian army, sir? I think I'll put it as operational maneuvers uh, because uh, 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 as for the reports come in, Russia had amassed about 200,000 troops, uh, which, is, which is only a, a part of uh, the Russian combat power, the military power. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is not a very major uh, portion of military power. But what Russia has actually done is using missiles uh, to target, to demoralize, and uh, limited missiles. Uh, you know, it is, uh, and uh, we should also understand that Ukraine had been uh, uh, supplied with and given javelin missiles, which are the anti tank guided missiles, because Russia believes in that as mechanized warfare, basically. So uh, Russia has not utilized. It doesn't need to utilize. That. The, if, uh, there's a three-pronged attack, and three-pronged attack uh, uh, is very difficult for the Ukraine with the, with the total forces about 200,000 again, and it is about to reserve the 900,000, which has neglected military for some time. So that's what I I keep saying that you know wars are not an option, right? 
war is the last resort. And if you're not prepared for war, you're writing war. And Ukraine was definitely not prepared for war. So operation readiness, defense preparedness is a must imperative to ward off such attacks, you know, ward off a, to prevent wars, to deter wars. Right? <clears throat> so that is one part. So Russia has achieved its objectives, I think, is, is well on the way for achieving its objectives. And the second part is the information, you know, to me, the battle on narratives. Uh, again, uh, granted to Russia, uh, they have used that and they've been threatening and they've been demoralizing, they've gone on report uh, of what they're saying. And a uh, number of videos have come out, uh, which I, I, I feel somehow these are videos which are you know, manipulated in the social media to me, uh, in various domains. And these are not war videos, actually. These are videos which are either, you know, uh, maneuvers which have been done earlier. Some of them are mixed with the, some of the videos now. It's, it's, a, it's a good, it's a good you know, visuals, visually saying what has happened. You find missiles going off, some fires. Uh, but like I said earlier, uh, the casualties, the damages, the collateral damage, the reports as yet, as yet, uh, are not indicative of major battles. So, uh, so it's a war of narratives uh, which uh, Russia uh, has done. And uh, if you look at, uh, you know, let, let's go back to uh, even Germany, uh, which I said Nord Stream 2 will, uh, sus will be suspended. But you can't very little come out of Europe actually. Very little. The EU, EU is converted very little. They're, they, they're all waiting and watching as to what next, what's going to happen, what the US is going to do. There's a lot of talk in the US, a lot of people have come out and spoken. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the battle of perspectives and narratives has gone on. Uh, I do feel uh, that information domain is a very important domain and it has to be integrated into, uh, as an integrity part of any warfare. Now. Any warfare, any warfare, right from the low intensity to the highest form of warfare to conventional conflict, it is fully integrated and it's a very important subset of warfare. Absolutely. And a lot of people actually blame India for not doing it, but we do it enough. Only thing is, it's difficult for us to read it because it's outwardly projected. So, you know, there was some stuff done by with the Saudi uh, army chief's visit as well. And there was a whole hullabullah that happened across the border lines, but not in India. That much something that we must understand. So finally, India. We need, uh, need structure and system. So I, yes, absolutely. There is no question. Sir. We need formal structures. Right? Formal structures are very important. We spoke about it earlier too. Yes, absolutely. Sir. sir, coming to India, finally, um, you know, the Ukrainians have requested India to intervene and, you know, speak to the uh, president of Russia. As a matter of fact, yesterday night, it was reported that the uh, President Putin spoke to uh, Prime Minister Modi at the insistence of the Russians themselves. Actually, they initiated this request. Um, is there a golden opportunity that India is sitting on today? And uh, how do you portray India's picture in this entire game? Sir? So, well, let's look at uh, India of today. Uh, India of today is a risen, responsible, resurgent nation, a regional power, a global leader. So, uh, and we, we have uh, maintained a uh, Equilibrium balance in a very big way. We are part of the, most of the multi multilaterals, whether it is BRICS, uh, IPSA, RIC, which is Russia and China, we are part of the G20, we are part of the T10, we are part of Quad. Uh, so if you look at BIPSTEC, so you name it, we are part of it. So we, our acceptability of India is there. And we, we have a prime minister who does, uh, you know, who reaches out, uh, who reaches out and who is uh, respected. So that's how we find. Uh, uh, that uh, request or you know in the, the intervention of India to ensure peace is pouring in, and India should ensure peace. But in that, I, I also feel even the US is telling India that uh, you you know you you are abstaining from the UNSC was not the right thing. The strategic the people they they're talking about it, but I think in all this, India has to look at being pro India, not being anti India, anti Russia or anti US or pro US or pro Russia, not taking sides. Looking at peace, an acceptable peace, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, acceptable to uh, the affected parties, that is Russia and Ukraine, and also looking at pro-India stance. We have to understand that uh, uh, our military hardware, 60% uh, military hardware approximately comes from Russia. Right? Russia has been uh, a very, you know, a, a, has partnered us in defense and other things and all this supported us. Not the US, not so, US all supported us. But in all this, they don't support India, they support their interests. Right? 
they further their interests. And that is one thing we've got to take it forward, that we should look at India's interests, our national interests. Uh, right now, the immediate, immediate uh, uh, interest for India is to get our people out, our national our national assets which are there, uh, safeguard them, and safeguard our national interests uh, in the future. We have China locking at our borders, but that does not mean that if we if we do not support uh, the U.S. against uh, Russia, then the board is board is not a military alliance. Board will go on, still go on. We should be very specific about it. We have to look after our national interests. We have to protect and project our national interests, and that's what we should, we have been doing, and we should continue. I think that is brilliantly put, sir, because at the end of it, we are looking at our own game and we need to look at our own establishment, our own setup and our, our own, as you mentioned, interests within of India. Uh, these whole emotional connects between, you know, everything else is 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 just emotional. I think it's, it's beyond that. And uh, the reality, as you also mentioned, that USA is, uh, you know, reliability is a big question today. And that's something which has been brought out in multiple domains. Um, I, I, you know, I actually, uh, it's, it's something that has been on the tip of everybody's mind who's looking at uh, strategic perspectives that USA is something which is not able to come up with a strategy themselves and you know, how to handle the situation. And as a matter of fact, they're looking for the world to align with them. And we don't see that happening even with their military allies. So why does India stand in the middle and put its neck out? Absolutely agree with you, sir. Sir, thank you so much for, uh, you know, uh, I think a very precise and a crisp roundup of what's happening. Uh, a lot of narratives is being portrayed. A lot of uh, scenarios have been put across in front of us with regards to, you know, some of them are doomsday scenarios as well uh, with the nuclear question and so on and so forth. But I think the reality, as you mentioned, is a little different. Russia has very, very pinpointed strategic objectives for its own self. And as per the message that actually you sent to me, a little bit, I'd like to read out the last line, which says that, you know, no, no country really wants to fight a war on its own land. So it, it, is, it is for the Russians to also do the same. Uh, I think that's, that's all I would like to say for this. So thanks once again for joining me and uh, giving me your perspective on the Russia and Ukraine, you know, battle of narratives and or a skirmish which is happening on the borders today. Thank you. And until next time, Jai Hind. Thank you, Adi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adi. Thank you, Dev Talks and Jahan. Jahan, sir.